And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here to have another conversation I'm hoping helps your business grow. Automation. We've all heard about it, but what is it? Is it robots? Is it AI? Is it machine learning? Is it software that does repetitive tasks? Hmm? Might be all of them. That's what we're going to talk about today. And before we get too far into that, I want to let you know that today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. Uh, I mentioned automation, and we are in an era of automation, much like the title of this episode. In order to get into what that is and how a lot of people are doing it on a lot of different levels... I've got with me today, Ari Ravitz. Ari's the CEO of Transcend Software. Welcome to Start Apostle, Ari. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Look forward to the talk today. And I, and I, I, I am looking forward to it as well. I love automation. But before we get started in that, can, let's get a little bit more about you and your backstory. Sure. So um, I... Uh, Went to GW for undergrad and spent my my years after college trying to do startups in the technology space. Um, you know, a lot of it probably builds on automation. My, my first startup was trying to help uh, small retailers in college towns put their products online and sell on the internet. And uh, as my career evolved, I went on to, uh, to business school. And after business school, I had to pay back my loans from business school. So I did the obligatory uh, work on Wall Street, worked for uh, Bank of America Securities as an equity analyst, covering all the oil and gas companies, uh, oil refiners, pretty much anyone who polluted the environment. That was my, uh, my coverage universe. <laughs> um, so after a couple of years and after my loans were paid back, I, uh, I went to go work to repay my debt to the environment. Um, and I worked uh, in the clean tech private equity fund. Um, and I got really interested in the water sector. And one of the investments that the fund I did was in a company called Organica Water, which is a wastewater technology company. And I uh, ended up leaving the private equity fund and going to be the CEO of Organica. And inside of Organica, we built this software tool that is Transcend Software today. Uh, so that's kind of just the high level on, uh, on how I got here today. So we're going to talk about automation and an era of automation. And I'm going to, you know, get, get into that and the, the who, what, where, when, how, why. But can you give us a couple more uh, tidbits about Transcend and the kind of automation that you do? And, and by the way, if you want to learn more about Ari's company, click the link in the show notes. You can go to transcendh2o.com. Sure. So uh, we have a software tool that automates the preliminary engineering of any kind of vertical asset. Uh, it started inside that wastewater technology company I mentioned, Organica Water. And the, the problem was we were this little startup that was trying to compete with massive companies that had armies of engineers. And we were spending hundreds of hours doing preliminary engineering. Uh, and I had, throughout my career, a lot of experience with automation. And so I was this guy who was not from the water industry coming in to run this company. And the first thing I, I thought was, why are we spending, you know, hundreds and ultimately thousands of hours doing these preliminary designs when ultimately our clients aren't getting to specify what they want and we have to go back and iterate and iterate again. And can we automate this? Uh, so we, we went out and hired software developers that were also engineers and subject matter experts. And we built a tool that automates preliminary engineering of a wastewater treatment plant. So something that used to take hundreds of hours with five different kinds of engineers, process, mechanical, civil, electrical, uh, now can be done just by putting 20 or 30 parameters in, and it'll produce all those engineering documents in the cloud using the exact same softwares that those engineers were drawing in before. 
And that created a ton of efficiency for Organica. And ultimately, we we're able to apply it to other industries. Uh, we're using it for utility scale solar design. We're using it uh, to convert parking lots into COVID testing facilities. That was actually one of our first use cases in, in the whole um, uh, COVID crisis uh, this year. So, um, yeah, so that's a little more on, on Transcend. So automation's everywhere. And, you know, whether you realize it or not, I mean, everything's automated from the Amazon package that you ordered that, I mean, that's incredibly automated from their uh, fulfillment centers to, you know, just simple software. What, and, and, you know, like I said, in this era of automation, I think it's first important to understand why. Now with what you just described, the why is, okay, look, automation has to help you sell more or spend less. And that's just a simple, you know, now, now are you went to, you have an MBA from Yale. Can you confirm that I am correct on what you need? <laughs> Preferably you want both of those things to occur, but let's just, let's make sure that the guy with the, the credentials uh, will agree with us on that because aren't those the basic tenets of automation? Sell more, or spend less. Absolutely. Can you cut costs? Can you do this more efficiently? Or is it something that can allow you to produce more output with you know the same resources and ultimately sell more? Uh, that's that's the premise of it. You can go back to ERP. You know when ERP first started, you know that was about cutting costs in kind of originally the accounting side of things and then eventually the manufacturing planning side of things. CRM, same thing. You know, how do we get more efficient in this case, sell more? How can we get smarter about, um, you know, targeting and following up on prospects? Um, and so now we're moving to a phase where things that are done um, the same way for hundreds of years, in this case, an engineer sitting there designing a building, can be done through automation. And so does that allow us to save money? Yes, it does. We don't have to spend as much to do that design. And does it allow us to sell more? Well, depending on your industry, you can produce a lot more designs and you can get better outcomes that ultimately make your clients happier. So mm -hmm. for sure. So sometimes, sometimes the sell more result can come from freeing up the bandwidth to actually have people focus on that kind of stuff. I think that automation at its heart begins with repetitive tasks that people aren't really that excited about doing in the beginning. And, you know, whenever I talk about automation or, or talk to a business about improving their, their BPO, their business process automation, you get people that are, that are scared of it. And we even talked about this before we hit record today. Um, sometimes, people, well, well, what am I going to do here? Where's my job going? Well, look, if you're valuable and you have and you create value for a company, your best your best uh, action is probably not something that can or could be automated because it's so highly repetitive that it's robotic. And, um, sure. you know, Very now true. now that said, automa automation doesn't install itself in your business. You have to begin looking at, you know, like I said, and in some cases you talk about these repetitive tasks. Many businesses have a hard time even finding people to do them because yeah. they're not they're not personally fulfilling. They're not like no one wakes up and says, man, I want to do the same action like a robot 10,000 times a day. Yeah, and, then, you know, and then, you know, there's one thing that, that's interesting about software and machines is even though they do require maintenance and upkeep and updates, they show up to work every day. Yeah, um, and, absolutely. and often they, they work. <laughs> yeah, they work long shifts, and that's 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 why software businesses and and software companies and many of these uh, startups that you see getting big valuations are what they are because they are in fact scalable. and And I speak to that as the owner of Full Scale, who is an all human company that that builds innovative things for people. But the one thing that isn't scalable about my business is people. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, you know, with, with that, you know, and, and, you know, if we look for the true what of like, what is automation and it's a noun, it says the use of largely automate automatic equipment and a system of manufacturing or other production processes. Yeah. And that's a pretty boring <laughs> explanation, but it's true. And on many levels, well, 
while automation is exciting, it is also, which is what it's meant to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's meant to be boring and standardized, right? So that you're you're repeating the same outcome over and over again. I mean, I, I'll tell you the story, how this whole software was born. You know, I was this, you know, guy with two finance degrees who just entered the water industry and the company Organica that I worked for was based in Budapest, Hungary. So I I'd, I'd packed up from New York from my job in private equity, brought my 3-year-old twin girls and my wife to Hungary and I show up to this company um and there's all these engineers that have been designing wastewater plants, you know, for 20, 30, 40 years. And I come in and basically say, the boring part of what you do, the preliminary design, you're, you're too smart for that. You know, your brain should be used to solve the really difficult problems. We can automate this. And I mean, it was, you know, a, an experience in cultural transformation. I mean, people, you know, the, the most senior engineer was the most terrified by this thing and fought the hardest against it. And if you ask him today, he would tell you that he doesn't know what his life would be like without it. Because his whole job shifted from having to do the repetitive, monotonous stuff and having to spend his extra hours, you know, the other, you know, 30 or 40 hours a week that he works normally on top of his base 40 on the challenging stuff to being able to do that on a full-time basis. It improved his quality of life, big fisherman, got to spend more time fishing, more time with his kids. And, and he was really adding much more value for the company while the software was doing that preliminary design work that previously he had to spend so much time on. Uh, it was just a total change in the culture of the company. Um, and that was kind of how we realized that, hey, this is something we can apply much more broadly than to just, you know, this one wastewater technology company. So do you think that do you think that that initial resistance to automation occurs from that inherent need to not be replaced? I think that's a part of it. I think in general, people are resistant to change. Um, you know, any, any time there's a new, completely new or disruptive way to do something that's been done the same way, you're going to have a lot of resistance from the old guard, people that are afraid to try new things, no matter how much technology evolves and, you know, five years ago, they were going to the office and buying everything retail. And today they're sitting in their home on video calls, buying everything online. But still, when it comes to their day to day, even if they're changing and all this change is happening around them, you know, they resist and, and they're, it's a fear. A lot of it is fear that, you know, what's going to happen to, to my job and um, what's going to happen to my future. So, um, and, and no, no one can, no one or nothing can do this as well or as accurately as I can. Um, uh, exactly. so I've run into the exact same things. And I think we should talk about that for a second because at your business or your startup, in my opinion, the, uh, w the, what's going to determine your success or failure and the speed at which you do, you get to either is your ability to find efficiency or in, in the failure case to not find efficiency. Um, there's yep. so many different things, you know, and we're, we really are in this golden era of automation. There are so many different things, but, but as a leader or someone that's coming in. So if you, if your, if your product or uh, creates automation and you need to sell that to clients or users, um, the way that you approach that and you, the way you, you, help the leaders of that organization you're helping get that installed is in many ways through, you know, that helpful understanding of, of how they sell it to their own team and yeah. say, Hey, look, you're valuable. You're in fact, you're so valuable. I don't want you doing this because you get paid way too much to do this. And I got to believe that you can provide more value to us in so many other ways. And that, that's one of the obstacles that I think you're going to, as a, as someone who's selling an automation related service or wanting to just install them in your company, you need to be prepared to talk to your people about, do you have any other tips or input about how to do that in a way that makes sense? 
And so we will start every discussion with a potential client by saying, you know, we sell software, but we're not a software company. This is about changing the way that you do business first and foremost. And the success or failure isn't going to be determined by the product. It's going to be determined by how you change the business processes around that. Um, we are constantly facing that resistance from people. And so I think a big part of what we try to do, like from a selling process is figure out who's the right person to talk to in the organization about this, you know, who's got the vision to see in two years and five years and 10 years, where my industry is going to be. And then the ability to find those other people inside the organization that can see the benefit and how that can kind of overcome this fear uh, and, and the just general inertia that's in there. Um, and we're not dealing with an industry, like our, our initial target is basically large engineering firms and utilities. So these aren't, you know, innovators and early adopters of new technologies. And, and when you look in the United States at the quality of our infrastructure, and I'm sure, you know, this has probably come up in past, you know, podcasts that you've done, but I mean, it's, it's falling apart. A lot of that is because, you know, there's a lack of innovation in those sectors, right? There's a lack of ability to take risk. And so, you know, and that's why Transcend exists. And we're, we think that we can help break that paradigm and have more sustainable infrastructure in this country, more re infrastructure that's more resilient to climate change, that's adopting new technologies um, by using software to automate some of the preliminary engineering because it forces the, com the, the, the industry players to the next phase. Software allows you to evaluate all these new technologies and automation does that for you. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that behavior change and finding the right people, it's a huge part of what's going to drive our success or failure. So what, what you guys are doing is about 12 notches ahead of where most basic business process automation starts. I made a I mean, it is because let's. I mean, most of us we're just trying to like print shipping labels automatically or something like that. You know, not design a bridge or a water treatment plant, and you know, but but the basic tenets of of automation and business. Uh, you know, I, I made a few notes about a few things that. So here's the thing: is when it comes to automation and becomes when it comes to improving your processes at your business, and you guys are in that business as well. Uh, and and I I've been a I'm kind of a nut when it comes to this stuff. You first have to look at the the best way to improve a process or to make it the most efficient is to not have to do it at all. That is literally like the crown jewel of efficiency. It's like, let's just right. stop doing it. So anytime right. you look at small business efficiency or business efficiency in general, you have to say, you know, do we even need to do this at all? And I'll give an example. So we had, and this wasn't even an automation process, but at, at a prior company I owned, we were spending, you know, basically $4 in loss prevention for every dollar we would have lost without it. <laughs> so it was actually four times. Yeah. And, and now it, it <laughs> didn't take long loser. for us to figure that out. Well, yeah. that was the thing. And, and yeah. in that case, it just had to do with the inaccuracy of shipping or order fulfillment. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, we were spending, for, you know, but, but the thing was, is want, when, when, an, when something occurred in that, in that realm, it was just a big pain in the butt. So the staff had kind of had kind of become conditioned to want to avoid that experience, but there wasn't thought around it as far as like, is this even valuable? So like I said, we're spending $4 in labor trying to, trying to prevent a dollar in loss somewhere else. So you just stop doing it and you accept that there is a level of failure that exists like nobody's perfect nothing's right. perfect things happen you know something falls off the truck and breaks occasionally like can't do a whole lot about that so you got to first start looking at, is at like you know do we even need to do this at all the next thing you have to look at and this is this is where people fail when, in my opinion when it comes to automation is well it's easier for me to just do that because it only takes a minute yeah and the thing is is it, it, it if you hear it only takes a minute 
It those only takes a minute. Out. Those, <laughs> those, are, those are famous last words of the yeah. inefficient. Uh, so <laughs> m- those minutes are similar to the jar of change that exists on your dresser or wherever you keep one. We all have one or, or whatever. And you're usually shocked when that thing's full, filled up and you go and you dump it out and you're like, wow. 374 bucks. Awesome. Yep, yep. Well, the th- same thing exists in your business. So with automation, I find that there's usually not a silver bullet that solves something on a 100% level. So another thing I see people fail at, they say, well, we tried something, but it only did 90% of what we needed it to do. And, I, and I'm going, man, that's a huge win. Right. Do you hear the same thing? Because like, yes, that, that sounds what your preliminary design software is. Like, h- hell, if we can get this thing to 90% on its own, then we put the finishing touches on it. Huge yeah. win. I mean, we're just trying to get to 20 or 30% initially. You know, sure. maybe, you know, a, a construction level drawing with nuts and bolts is, you know, we're, you know, years, if not, yeah, we're years away from being able to automate to get to that level. But we we constantly hear that from people is oh well but this is only doing the first 20 or 30 percent that's easy yet when you talk to the business owner the pnl owner and they look at that and they say well how much am i really spending on you know that first 20 or 30 percent how many times am i probably a lot yeah right and then you know if if I get later in my design and I, I find something that's wrong. I got to go back and start it again. And I got to spend that 20 and 30% again. So it ends up being a huge cost number um, and, a, and a big pain point in the industry. Um, and that's, you know, one of the main things I think we have going for us is that we can really help address. I mean, there's, you know, on a, in the U S alone last year, over a hundred billion dollars was spent on design of infrastructure. So transportation, bridges, water treatment, power plants, roads, those kind of things. Hundred billion dollars spent. And a lot of that is actually going towards the preliminary engineering work. And there's a lot of brain power, a lot of really smart people. Some of them young, right out of school, because those are the ones who usually get stuck with the repetitive work who are who are doing this. And you know, I think as a when we look at our infrastructure as a country, um, it could be so much better if we just put that brain power to use. Um, and so that's what we're trying to to accomplish. But um, I mean, definitely, um, people once you know they they go so quickly from from saying. Um, Oh, this can't be done, or you know, I've always done it this way. To well, why can't you just do the whole thing? You know, you can only do twenty, thirty percent of it. You know, that's not enough for us. So, um, you know, you have to kind of find that time evolution side of it that that people can see how their business will evolve as the uh, as you move up that curve. So I want to go on record as saying that I will take 20% of $100 billion anytime. (laughs) (laughs) If you feel like you don't want to save that government or whoever you are, I'll I'll take it. I'll actually take 10%. Of the twenty billion, and we'll yep. call it even. Um, now, I want to. I want to talk. I want to talk a sec in, here in a minute about some of the the most common forms of business automation, and some of them are pretty simplistic. Before we get into that, I want to remind everyone that today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by FullScale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. Now, with that, there are some basic basic things that small and startup level businesses. Now this is not as, this is not complex on the scale that you're working with, but there are, there are so many tools out there that business owners can use. I mean, they're infinite. Like I can't even name them because I, I would just probably have to sit here for 45 minutes and name names because there's that many there's, I mean, just literally, but the thing is you got to go look for them. So, but, but it starts with understanding what you're looking to automate. So I I have a short list of some of those things for those listening where you can probably make a big impact and a lot of it. Okay. It's some of this starts with getting software tools to communicate with each other. 
Um, you burn up a lot of little bits of time, little pieces, copying, pasting, uploading lists, doing things. Uh, we're in a world of connectivity when it comes to that. Um, you know, and like I said, this is back to that jar of change. So, um, you know, one of the things, and, and I don't normally shout out too many things, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, years ago, say five, five to seven years ago, software platforms weren't connected as easily as they are now. And I remember when uh, Zapier came out uh, and it was, a, it was a hub meant to connect APIs to each other. And I remember that because as the founder of Gigabook, people were always asking us if we connected to something else. Right. And we'd say, not only do we not connect to it, this is the first time we've ever heard of it. Because there's that many. So there are tools that exist strictly to try to help you connect software to other software. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are you, you know, that are do you use any tools like that or have you been familiarized with any in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it so when I was when I was in business school, I actually did um some CRM consulting on the side to help kind of pay my way through. And a lot of that was just like really simple business automation inside of Salesforce and it mostly in enterprise software companies. Um, half of it was about, um, you know, where you spend your time, right? So a sales director not having enough information to be able to understand where the people in her organization we're going to spend their time on the highest value prospects. Um, so, you know, avoiding spending, wasting time, avoiding wasting time on uh, potential prospects who, if you, you know, look at the data, you'd know up front are pretty unlikely to, to become a customer. Um, and then the other part of it was just taking stuff that was done in an inefficient manual way and a non-standardized way. For example, the way you qualify prospects or the way that you're recording the progress of your different meetings against them and, you know, forcing those seven or eight different ways that your 10 different salespeople are using into one standard methodology and designing a system that was simple enough for that. Um, so, you know, you'd have that like on the on the simplest scale. Um that's probably where I got some of my. I, I have all three of those on my list. Actually, you nailed three of three <laughs> list items right there. Awesome. You have CRM, CRM tasks, yeah. forms, and reporting. Yep. So, like, those are all three. Very, so, uh, a lot of businesses, as much as you as you mentioned, spend. Well, this is all valid data, and it's got to go a bunch of different places. So, without automation, a lot of companies get stuck with someone putting these sheets together, these reports together, uh, uh, they ha you look at forms. So, you know, there's, there's 10 different forms that they could be internal, they could be external, they, they could be client-based, they could be anything-based. And they're collecting things. And, and whoever built the forms often didn't put them in the same one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten column row or A through right. G or however you want to look at it. So what instead, so you get this jumbled data and that's, these are things that take time. These are, jar, these are coins in the jar. And yeah. also another thing too is back to software showing up every day. If your automation set up properly, it can create these reports. It can collect the data through forms. It can do the CRM tasks and it can deliver them to the people that want to see them at the times that they, at the times that they want to see them. And, and on many levels also in this day and age, do a lot of creative analysis. Like you mentioned basic CRM tasks, like, okay, are we, are we pointing our effort at the wrong clients? Like we do right. that at full scale. There, there's a, actually some methods of scoring that we look for. Cause you know, we look for, we, we know that, that customers and clients that exist in, in businesses that have a specific makeup have the highest level of success and growth with us as a company. Mm -hmm. So that's who we want to try to aim towards because the right. last thing we want are clients that aren't succeeding within our system. So, and I don't might even mind sharing that. Like the, I mean, we, we, the companies that grow the quickest and find the most success at full scale have between 10 and a hundred employees. 
Yeah. You know, like it's, that's, that's the very first place to start. And some of that right. is on a form somewhere that collected data or a lead, or I don't know, it did a bunch of different stuff. And, right. and, you know, a lot of people collect data and get lists and stuff like that. And those come in a completely different format. So how do you begin to, to analyze that stuff? Yeah. And then like, as far as the APIs and connecting with different softwares, and that's actually a lot of what Transcend does. Um, so, you know, if you look at like how a wastewater plant is designed today, you have a process engineer using a simulation software and probably between one and 10 different Excel mathematical calculation tools and calculators. And then you have, they, they finish their work and they hand it off to a mechanical engineer. And you have a mechanical engineer who's using their own spreadsheets and databases usually to size and select all the equipment, all the stuff that goes into that facility. So they take all of that and they're using different software tools to do that. And they hand it to a uh, electrical engineer who does a similar thing with different softwares and ultimately to a civil and an architectural engineer who's using a CAD software or a BIM software to put the whole thing in a box, some kind of building. And what Transcend did in the beginning and what we do today is we just connect all those dots. So if you're using multiple software tools, we're going to standardize that around one. If it's, you know, a simple calculation methodology, it'll just go into code. If it's a simulation software that's specific to an industry or a CAD or a BIM software, we'll generate the parametric data set that can then be used by those software tools for later detailing. Um, I think as when we talk about like the era of automation at a, at a B2B level, you know, a lot of it is about connecting the software that you're already using because that's what people are doing every day. Um, and that's where a lot of the inefficiency has been created is the different people using different softwares on those handoffs from one place to the next, to the next losing data. Um, certainly in the engineering industry, that's where a ton of inefficiency is. So, um, so that's what we're, we're trying to address there. So I, when we have our company meetings at full scale, uh, the, my, my buzz phrase lately has been delegate or innovate. And sometimes, you know, sometimes innovate, look, little basic innovation within your business is uh, sometimes about creativity. And people will say, well, this software doesn't connect to this software. Okay, but you look at it and maybe both softwares connect to Google Sheets. Now yep. you have a connection. You now they connect. And They're integrated. Right. And, and the same thing, like there's a lot of these tools that you can get for free that create yeah. an interesting bridge. So, you know, I mentioned earlier the founder of Gigabook as well, which is built in my spirit of automation. So that's uh, booking an appointment flow, which does notifications, reminders, puts it on your calendar, uh, you know, does invoicing, does a whole bunch of different stuff. There's a whole daisy chain of stuff that comes in there. Um, yeah. so that's another tool, uh, when it comes to basic automation. Now, look, six years ago, people like, okay, now if you don't have a booking link, whether you're using Gigabook or Calendly or anything else, use something because you yeah. waste a lot of time scheduling appointments and you don't even know it. Like there's nothing better sure. than seeing when someone's available. Well, you use Gigabook to book a time on this podcast. Otherwise yep. we would have sentenced ourselves to emailing or someone email, when are you available? I don't know. When are you available? When are you available? No, I'm not going to work. When are you available? And then, and then who knows, maybe you forgot. So, you know, Gigabook reminded you of, of this. It, it let you know that you were booked. It let me know you were booked. It's on my calendar. It texted it's on, me yeah. and emailed yes. me. And yes. And get, yeah. and guess what, dude, people don't miss the show. Yeah. Like, I mean, it happens I'm like sure. one out of a hundred times because at a minimum, they reply to multiple emails and say, I'm not available. I need to reschedule that. Right. That is okay. But yeah. it's just the blank screen when we're waiting in the studio. So, and yeah. speaking of which, you know, we are, we are on this episode, we're using our beautiful new virtual studio that now I didn't, I didn't. I didn't put Ari in front of a true live stream today, 
but you can check this out on video and you can confirm that my face is made for radio um, <laughs> by watching us on video. So we are going to be live streaming all of our episodes very soon. Okay. So um, now and not every, but not go ahead. I was just going to say just to build on that. So at, at transcend um, and really at all the companies I've done over the years, I mean, we're constantly looking for new tools like this. So like, I'll give you an example and, you know, just we use a software called Better Proposals. Um, it's called betterproposals.io, you know, giving them a free plug, I guess. And um, it, it, we, we, we save so much time on how we put together proposals. And we've been able to standardize it because of that software tool. And then after we send so it much out. Of that's, so much of that's automated. And yeah. like, and a lot of it's boilerplate things. Yep. And like these, these things are, so I, I'll give another shout out. So, all right. So you went you, at Yale, it, when you had to, it, to get your MBA, you invariably had to create financial projections on some level for a business that, you, for yeah. the Ac- Acme Corp and their widgets, right? Because- sure. Yeah. I went to business school too, and we all sold widgets for Acme Corp, um, <laughs> which is a guarantee. Like it's amazing how many people work for Acme. Um, yeah. But but with that, the the creation of of the projections. So if you have this like formal business plan that's sixty pages or something, the last twenty five of it are excruciatingly complex financial tables and stuff like that. That that if you get okay, so one you add a zero. And you accidentally turn a hundred thousand into a million. It messes up the whole entire oh, table, okay. and and you're and you failed. Uh, so you know, I use LivePlan.com, hmm. which is like twenty bucks a month, and it's like I don't even care about the first half of the business plan builder. I use it for those tables that that builds because it walks and it does a whole lot of different stuff. That like, okay, I when I was in school, I had to take a whole I had a whole class that was a whole semester that was about doing nothing other than what I described that for a mere 20 bucks a month, you can operate on the level of an MBA. And, and you know, that, and and that, and that's, that's important (laughs) stuff. Like, Hey, no one likes doing that anyway. No, after business school, when I worked as an equity analyst, you know, my first year I was doing that stuff all the time. And, you know, it was interesting, like watching that industry of all of the past 15 years, I mean, you need a lot less people to do that now. And those people that were doing that are actually running startups and doing great stuff for the world, right? So, you know, you always hear about people say, like, when the automation of work comes, what is everybody going to do? We're going to have thousands of people. More important stuff. People, it's it's improving efficiency across the board, I think. Um, Certainly saw that in the equity uh, research industry when it happened. It's also improving accuracy. And, you know, yeah. that's the thing is like you want you better embrace automation if you want your packages from Amazon and the speed and accuracy at which they deliver them. Now, speaking of which, that's something I want to talk about, because also on my list of highly automatable are things related to shipping and inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, shipping is and, and I we were experts at this. So in my book, Million Dollar Bedroom, I talked about the event ticket business that we had, which became highly automated by the time we were in our last couple of years. And to give you an, an idea of the scale at which we were selling uh, when we were in San Fran, when my wife and I were in San Francisco. In 2016, we stopped by StubHub headquarters because they found out we were going to be there. And like, you have to come by. I'm like, why do they want us to come by so bad? We didn't even know it. We had been in the top 20 of their concert ticket sellers for four straight years. Wow. So of course they wanted it. They were like, yeah, this is a big client. I was like, whoa, I didn't even know that. Hmm. But we w- we got to that level by the efficiency that we created. So we had built and automated stuff that that helped our, helped us create purchase orders. It helped us create invoices. And more importantly, it helped us automatically create and print out the shipping labels. So we were at the, we were at the point where we were sending out a couple hundred packages a day. And, we were, and my wife did that. She was the one that did that oh because we had set up the automation in a way that it printed the tickets. Now it sucked because we had to print electronic tickets a lot, right. but they, they wanted the shipping. That's just the way they did it. But it would ju- it just became like a, a an envelope checking and stuffing yeah. kind of thing. So we could blaze right through it, but you know, have that automation not existed and we had to stop and give attention to every single order and every single shipping label that 
that went with that, that would have been, there's no way we would have kept up. We would have been like that episode of I Love Lucy where she works at the candy factory and it just starts coming faster and faster and faster. Next thing you know, it's piling up and the line stops. Now, I I want to bring that up as well, because if you're trying to figure out where to find efficiency or the problems to solve at your business, all you have to do is follow, follow anything around and see where things stop or slow down. Yep. That's a very that's a very basic tenet of increasing efficiency at your small business. So if packages are piling up like at your in your fulfillment area or wherever you're doing if you ship stuff, that's one thing. Wherever wherever things seem to stop, stall or slow down, uh and, and a lot of that uh also invoicing and payment. Um so when it comes to ba- to accounting, payroll, things like that. These are things. So, you know, a lot of people uh, have said, well, I don't, I want to do payroll in house. Why? Why? Like, I mean, we, for a couple hundred bucks a month, paychecks or someone like that, or or ADP or whoever, Gusto, whoever you want, they'll do it for you. And these are things that if you're trying to do in house, you're, you're paying significantly higher amounts than what you could for someone else that'll automate it. But you can also the same thing with invoicing, you know, like most of the time there's something that connects in and out of your invoicing, whatever your accounting software is and tries to find that efficiency. And, and a lot of the people that are doing that, small business owners, sometimes it's just like one or two people, that's their time that they're spending on that, right? I mean, that's such a waste. Like if you could, people, I think, always underestimate the value of their time. And if True. they could spend those, you know, pennies in the jar on other stuff, how much growth could their business have that they were missing out on? How many new opportunities could they could they have for their their company? So you know that's I think where a lot of the value comes from is just that freed up time, um, especially for some. You know, of, the some small, of it's a better, just a, a happier. Some of it's just a happier, more like a self fulfilled type employee. Because like I said, is people inherently don't wake up wanting to do robotically uh, repetitive tasks. All right, so I got another one on here that is really starting to evolve from the the process automation standpoint. And that's email and support. And you're seeing a lot. So the chat bot and a lot of different things. So different types of AI and machine learning are popping up all over the place. So here's if you have a client or a user that is wanting an answer, um, and uh, there are certain there are certain keywords, patterns, or things that they're asking for. That the, certain types of chatbots and automation can give that person an answer, or like, look, that the but but they want our personal interaction. No, they don't. They want an answer. They yeah. want an answer, and they want to be led to something that tells them either how to do it, what to do with it, or any of that. And so this is this is. The, these eight, eight, you know email and especially like the support and different types of chat that that exist are are meant to be programmable on any level and so you you look at well so we use these like we use a platform called intercom which pretty, you see everywhere now and sure. if, a, if it's a live support and, and here's the thing is the bot will attempt to answer it, it'll if someone says I need help setting up invoices well we've programmed it to to in you know recognize invoice or invoices or iterations of that and it just automatically replies are you looking for help setting up invoices and it gives you you know a couple different things like you can do that on this page or here's a support article that goes with it uh, if this didn't answer your question click here it's amazing. And, do well. It is because yeah. the thing is, is that is is that prevent is that usually gets that person right on top of an answer. It does it in a hurry, and it and it lets our people stay working on other stuff that isn't stopping and answering. You know things like that. It's not that we don't want to do it. It's just it's a better, smarter way to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that that's a be- I love the AI and machine learning side of things when it comes to that. You're probably talking to a robot online most of the time and don't know yeah. it. And you so. don't realize it. Yeah. I mean we we yeah. do it on like if you're listening to this podcast and you go to transcendh2o.com, you know, a chat box will pop up for you within minutes and 
that, you know, that that's actually how we found some of our initial customers. Um, and it is a lot of it is automated. Um, the AI is incredible. I mean, just in the past six months, some, you know, they release new features all the time and you've seen it, you know, evolve so much. And I'm starting to see it more and more on, on different websites. Um, and for, for Transcend, what we're doing on the software side with AI is that, at you know times a hundred because basically our AI algorithms are saying, hey, normally you would have designed it this way, but here's a much more optimized way that you could design this building. And these are the results that it'll give you. It'll give you less energy consumption, less carbon emissions, lower capital costs for that building. Um, and we're using evolutionary algorithms for that in the design. So whereas the engineer sitting there today using their brain when they're doing the preliminary design, typing the calculations in, these algorithms are constantly learning for us. And the more designs we're doing, the more optimized the outcomes are going to be. Um, so it can help at a large scale as well, you know, when you think about how, you know, a, a power plant is designed, for example. And the, and like I said, that's way past the, the level of what most people listening need yeah. or want. So, like, if they can do that for that, then you can do it for whatever it is that you're doing. Now, once again, uh, with us today, Ari Ravitz. Ari is the CEO of Transcend Software. Click the link in the show notes, learn more about what they're doing. Uh, now, before we get into the Founders Freestyle, I want to remind everyone that today's episode of Startup Hustle was brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you find and build a software team quickly and affordably in a very non-automated way. Uh, actually, that's untrue. We actually do some some certain things. We uh, uh, when we have new clients, we have built our own management portal for full scale, and we ask specific questions on the way in. I'm a big nut about onboarding, so uh, we ask a few specific yeah. questions on the way in, and that way, when users get in their client portal, they can already see recommendations related related to which uh, available resources we have that might fit their needs. Now, that's not high levels of automation, but it doesn't hurt. So uh, as promised, we end episodes of Startup Hustle with the Founders Freestyle. And I am going to hand you the mic here in a second, because I would like to hear if you have any input, information, or comments that you would like to make related to today's episode that we might not have hit on or that you found to be highly important. Thank you. Um, I, I would, I guess, I think we hit on a lot. Um, I think, you know, automation can help from a sole proprietor, small business, all the way to massive engineering firms that, you know, have cultures that need to change uh, to help us design more sustainable infrastructure. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of automation is not about the software itself. The software enables it, but it's more about you understanding how your business functions, where the bottlenecks are, where the opportunities are that you can increase revenue or reduce cost as, as we started with. Um, and then having the will to make that happen inside your company. Uh, as you've seen over decades of automation kind of creeping into business, those that adopt it first and embrace it first and transform their cultures around it very often are the ones who end up being most successful in their industry. So I'll leave it, leave it there. Actually, that, that was a perfect ending because I think you're a hundred percent right. It's the, I mean, the software is the software, but if you don't understand what it is, the problem that you need to solve, the software probably isn't going to do it for you. I mean, on some levels it might, I mean, on the basic connectivity stuff we talked about, that can be pretty straightforward, but you have to try to understand the why you know, the why of what you want to do and like really come into it. And remember, that's a pretty, I think you get a pretty easy start with that. I want to figure out how to sell more or spend less. And, and that, those are the zeros and ones behind that. That's the most binary thing. Now, if you can do both, then you really win. So, you know, other, other uh, kind of uh, cheap cliche things, better, faster, cheaper. 
Um, look, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to go to Yale to learn that one. Like that's pretty much, we get that's that, true. we get that everywhere. That's the basic tenet. Now here's <laughs> the thing is if your business isn't doing it better, faster, or cheaper, you gotta, you have to be, business school will teach you, you have to be winning. You have to beat your competition at two out of three of those things at a minimum to, to be ahead, to maybe be ahead in the race. If you get all three, you're really on to something. So look, better yeah. is about better response time, more accuracy, uh, faster, cheaper, like automation conquers all three of those in many different ways. So you got to look at all those different things. And the, th the thought I want to leave everyone with is remember when it comes to efficiency, always ask yourself, do we even need to do this at all? Because you will find yeah. in many cases that your business has been habitual. Like you have formed habits around certain things and doing stuff that really in the end isn't that important and you can live without that process. So before you learn to automate, see if you can, if it like really look at it, say, do we even need to do this at all? Because if you don't, then there you go. That's the one thing that's better than automation is literally just chopping a process out if you don't need to do that. Speaking of which, I'm yeah. going to go take a look at my own business and figure out where I can automate or create some more efficiency. So I'll see you next time, Ari. All right, great. Thank you very much.